going to uh, continue talking about uh, uh, this constant mean curvature and minimal surfaces, and mostly in R3 today. I don't think I'm leaving R3. Or, well, there's one theorem that's, yeah, I guess I'm not really leaving R3. So uh, one, of the, one of the big problems that we like to look at from time to time, still haven't gotten too far on it, but we make progress as the years go by, uh, it's this conjecture that says if you have two convex curves, Jordan curves, in parallel planes, then the only possible uh, minimal surface that's connected and bounds those two Jordan curves must be an annulus. So that must, that's our, topologically a cylinder. There's no genus to the surface. Okay, so I started talking about this conjecture a little bit last time, but I'm going to kind of redo that. Um, okay. Um, and one of the things I'm going to prove today is if you have an angel, suppose the conjecture is true, and I want to try to understand the shape of the surface, one aspect of the shape of the minimal annulus is that if you take a plane that's in between the two Jordan curves, some plane in between. So here's a plane P1, a plane P2, and you take a plane in between, then the intersection is again a convex Jordan curve. Okay? And uh, we're going to prove some other things about, about uh, this minimal annulus. Properties about the Gauss map and properties about the index what's called the index of the minimal annulus. Okay, so it's related to questions about stability, whether it's like sort of locally least area. So anyway, so one of the things that Schiff improved was this property about intersect all the planes in between intersect in a convex curve if it's an annulus. In particular, they're all transverse to the, to the annulus. Okay, they actually intersect transversely. Okay, so um, that's one thing I'm going to do today. Uh, there was this more general conjecture that says that it, the similar thing is true if you have a Jordan curve here and a collection of Jordan curves here, which form the boundary of a collection of pairwise disjoint disks. But anyway, this is the main conjecture, and that's a, you know, a generalization. But we can't even prove this one, so that one seems pretty far away at the moment. Uh, but it's, it seems to be true, but I just, I just certainly don't know how to prove it. Okay. Okay, I'm having issues here. I wonder if my battery's coming. A second. Bad time to have a battery at work. Go months and months without changing batteries. Hopefully this one works. If it doesn't, they have a laser pointer. Okay, there. No. Oh, there. there we go. All right. Okay, so um, yes, and, th and there's this more general, another more general conjecture, which also we know quite a bit about, is if, uh, if the planes are tilted. So if you have sort of this picture, a plane, horizontal plane, and uh, say a half plane here, like a wedge, a Jordan curve on this half plane, a Jordan curve on this half plane, then again you have the similar conjecture that all you have are minimal annuli. If you have convex curves on parallel planes, not, not parallel planes, but on, on planes that link each other, then in general it's not true. You have higher genus minimal surfaces. So, so this conjecture is, is, is there's some kind of a nice conjecture. There's a, a somewhat generalization of it. Oh, I know what I'm doing wrong. Okay, so I'll put it here. Okay, and, uh, and we have this general. Oops, not having much luck here today. Okay, all right. So that's the generalization, and um, we have this uh, very nice result that says if you did have a higher genus minimal surface, for example. Uh, then all of the uh, surf all the surfaces that are there are embedded. Okay, so you, you have embedded surfaces. So notice that Schiffman's result that each level set is a is a convex Jordan curve 
implies the annulus, any an minimal annulus is embedded. So it's a union of convex curves and parallel planes, so the minimal annuli are certainly embedded. But this result doesn't, doesn't use that fact. It just uses the fact that um, the surface is always embedded, even if, even if it did have higher genus. Okay? And it's kind of using the same argument. A fairly straightforward corollary of this result, is, of the proof of this result, is that there's a bound on the genus. So if you fix the Jordan curves, they are, say, smooth, then there's a bound on the genus of possible counterexamples to the conjecture. So those are some kind of nice parse results. Now, in order to understand these, we really need to get a, a, a sort of a more complete definition of a minimal surface. So uh, if you have a minimal surface in R3, lots of times we think of this as a mapping of an abstract surface into space. So we have an embedded surface that somehow maps into space uh, isometrically. Then this surface, I think, think of the surface as being in the space itself, like it's embedded. Then it has mean curvature. That's equivalent to any of the other properties. So small pieces, little disks on, little uh, geodesic disks on the surface, small radius, uh, they are, um, have least area with respect to their boundary. Uh, they have least energy. I'm not going to define what that means, but uh, it's somehow related to like physical energy. And if you minimize energy, then you create something physical, which by, by, by surface tension, so you get soap films. So folks, soap, so the property of minimizing energy also, somehow energy and area are proportional when you uh, parameterize the surface conformally. So those are essentially the same numbers up to a fa like a two, factor of two. The coordinate functions are harmonic. This is again related to energy. The coordinate functions minimize their energy relative to their boundary values. They're the unique sort of energy minimizing maps. Harmonic, the coordinate functions are harmonic functions. And very, very useful for lots of problems is this last property, the Gauss map uh, of the surface. So I'm assuming the surface is orientable. Then you take the unit normal to the surface. You translate it to the two-sphere. Then to be meromorphic, I'm going to stereographically project onto the complex plane. That's called the meromorphic Gauss map. This is somehow the Gauss map, and, but if I view it like this, and I call it the meromorphic Gauss map. And to be meromorphic just means, in this case, you're angle preserving. And this is essentially because this, the shape operator, if you pick a good basis, looks like A minus A, okay? That's, that's if you pick the right coordinates, that's, Okay, now that kind of matrix is angle preserving. It's A, which is homothety, times the identity matrix. So it's a very simple kind of matrix. Okay, so it's angle preserving. Now, when I say angle preserving, I should show a picture because A minus A, of course, is not angle preserving, it's sort of anti preserving. Okay, so when I say angle preserving, so I think of I parameterize a little part of the surface by a disk in the plane. I can do that conformally by uniformization. A disk only has one conformal structure. So I can parameterize it by the unit disk in space. When I do that, I preserve angles. Now the Gauss map, remember the, I said the Gauss map has a matrix that looks like this, where A squared is the Gaussian curvature, you can kind of do this at each point, uh, the Gaussian curvature at the point, okay, hmm? uh, minus, minus a squared, okay. But if I change the orientation of the sphere, instead of having the outward pointing normal on the sphere, I take the inward pointing normal. Why is the inward pointing normal better? Because the inward pointing normal makes this matrix have a plus sign. 
And then I'm angle preserving. Otherwise, I'm somehow like not exactly angle preserving. So I, I just kind of change the orientation. Then I say I preserve angles. That's the orientation on the sphere that comes from stereographic projection. The standard orientation on the sphere is with the upward pointing normal. And when you fold the plane onto the sphere by stereographic projection, that normal vector is inward pointing on the sphere. OK, so that's why the trace of the second fundamental form is 0 just means the derivative map is angle preserving. So if I take two, for example, in that nice grid picture, if I take a grid here, it goes to a grid here, goes to somehow orthogonal grid on the two sphere. At least wherever the, the Gaussian curvature is not zero. So if the Gaussian curvature is zero, then it's a you know, conformal in a kind of a weak sense. We have what's called branch points like the holomorphic function z squared on the plane. It's angle preserving, and at the origin, the derivative is zero. So it doesn't make a lot of sense to talk about preserving angles. So it's, except for isolated points, uh, the derivative map is a diffeomorphism at those points, local diffeomorphism. And then, so it really makes sense to talk about preserving angles. Anyway, that's the property of meromorphic functions. They're angle preserving wherever the derivative is not zero. OK, so that's the picture. So we can think of. The Gauss map is a map from the unit disk into the extended complex plane. And that's going to be important maybe later in a later lecture today, later part of the lecture. Any questions about that? It's very, very important, very nice. Trace second fundamental form means the Gauss map preserves angles if you take the inward pointing normal on the two sphere. And no questions, right? Any questions? No questions. OK. So I'm going to do an application of that last property. I'm going to try to understand the geometry of what are called triply periodic minimal surfaces. So these are minimal surfaces in R3 that are invariant under translation in three independent directions. OK, so we're going to apply that property about the gas map being a meromorphic function uh, to uh, these triply periodic minimal surfaces, OK? So here's one of the examples we saw before. It's uh, discovered by Schwartz. And it's basically uh, a, has a building block. So on the left, you have this building block. The surface is orthogonal to the relative planes of a cube. So imagine this little surface in a cube, and it's orthogonal to the, the, to the faces of the cube. And I can just take that surface and translate it. And it will match up with itself analytically. So if I do that, this is a building block, and it makes a triply periodic surface in R3, which we can view as being invariant under translation, one unit in the x direction, the y direction, or the z direction. Right. One way to see that, the, that it's a building block is if you, these curves are orthogonal to the relative planes, these planes uh, on the boundary of the face. And if you have what's called a planar line of curvature on a sur minimal surface, you can reflect across the plane and extend the surface analytically. But when I reflect across that, in fact, I get a translation of the original piece. The surface itself also has some other reflective symmetries. Right? There's some other sort of reason. If you'd believe, there are certain reflective symmetries. They're kind of reflecting in vertical and horizontal planes based in the center somehow. OK, so that's, that's our Schwartz surface. And we're going to try to be looking at points. Now, this surface lives in R3. But we can look at it as a quotient surface in the three torus, in a three torus. So, so this surface here. I draw it real fast so we can keep track of it. OK, there we go. And it kind of comes out at us. And you know, back there is another part of it. OK, if you look at these particular points, those are points where the Gaussian curvature is 0. Those are what are called saddle points. If you look around those points, it kind of 
I'm not drawing a very good picture, but a little, if you could, these are the saddle points. So you could, if a monkey could put his legs here and his tail would fall down here. So it looks like a monkey, monkey saddle point. And those are points where the Gaussian curvature are zero. Those are branch points for the Gauss map. Okay, and if I look at this surface, so this particular surface is invariant, this is part of it, a fundamental domain, under say, z cross z cross z, which equals z3. So I can view this as a minimal surface that's compact in a three torus, which is R3 modulo Z3. So this gives me a closed surface, closed minimal surface. Okay, and here, well, if it's closed, it has a genus. So let's just try to understand what is the genus. Basically, the building block is a sphere, and then the top with some disks removed, and this top circle glues to the bottom circle. So that means I attach a handle to the two-sphere. This, this side, it glues to this side, so I attach another handle, and then the front and the back glue together under translation, so I have genus three. So the genus of the surface is three. If you have a triply periodic minimal surface in R3, it's invariant under orientation preserving translations, then the Gauss map is equivariant with respect to uh, translation. So the quotient, the surface of genus three and its three torus, it has a well-defined Gauss map, again, to the two sphere. But this is much nicer because this is a compact Riemann surface, or compact Riemannian surface. So in particular, it has a conformal structure. And now, but it's compact, it's closed. So this we can now view as a meromorphic function. And since everything is compact, it has finite degree, right? So somehow the Gauss map covers up the sphere with some kind of integer multiplicity. And where you have branch points, the multiplicity is less, but branch points only occur a finite number of points, times. So above each point, generically, I have exactly n points. If this Gauss map is more market function has degree n. So I see a branch covering outside of the branch, outside of the pre-images of the branch points, I see somehow like a covering space of fixed degree. Okay, so that's, that's what we're trying to understand. What can I say, for example, about this surface that I didn't know before? Okay, so one of the things we're gonna check is whenever you have a genus three minimal surface, another triply periodic minimal surface, so genus three in the quotient, then the surface always has a non-trivial symmetry. So if you look at a zero of Gaussian curvature, and you take minus the, the inversion through that point. So x goes somehow to minus x. If you think of this as being the origin in the three torus, you have this inversion of the three torus, it leaves invariant the surface. That's pretty neat. So every genus three minimal surface has this very nice asymmetry, has symmetry, through its zeros of Gaussian curvature. Any zero of Gaussian curvature, I can do an inversion through it. It leaves the surface invariant. So we're gonna study that a little bit, okay? And we're gonna get some interesting other properties. Okay, so that's, that's uh, first we're gonna do this. In general, we have, suppose you have a three to flat three torus, and we're looking at a closed orientable minimal surface in it of genus G, then we have the Gauss map has degree G minus one. So this is also really important. Remember the, the second fundamental form is like that, right? And the determinant of this matrix is telling you is the Jacobian of the derivative map, okay? Which tells you how you change area, right? 
The determinant of a matrix tells you the area of the related stretching factor for how area stretches. So, so, so if we integrate the Jacobian, we're going to get the degree of the Gauss map. So since the Gaussian curvature function on the surface, any, any minimal surface in R3, is the Jacobian of the derivative map at each point, then I can identify the integral of the Gaussian curvature with the area of the image, counted with multiplicity. So if I might cover up a given disk 10 times, then I have to add, add uh, that area 10 times. So when I say area, it's area in the sense of counting multiplicity. Now if the Gauss map is a diffeomorphism, it is exactly the area, but it, maybe it's not one to one. So if it's not one to one, I'm counting the area with multiplicity. Well, we have constant degree. So outside of a finite number of points, I cover up every point, the degree of the Gauss map times. And always with the same sign. Remember the Gaussian curvature is negative. So I'm going to get uh, the degree of the Gauss map in the meromorphic sense. I'm taking the inward pointing normal on the sphere. Uh, the area of the sphere is 4 pi. So it's, I cover up the sphere somehow n times where n is the degree of the Gauss map. And the area of the sphere is 4 pi, so the integral of the Gaussian curvature is the degree of the Gauss map times 4 pi. It's an exact formula. <coughs> okay, but I also have gauss binet I also know something about the integral of the Gaussian curvature on a closed surface. I could have a formula that relates it to the Euler characteristic. Okay, so by gauss the bonnet the, minus the integral of the Gaussian curvature is minus 2 pi times the Euler characteristic, which is equal to this, right? Now notice there's a 4 here. There's, it's 4 pi times 1 minus g. And I got a feeling I should have put a minus. I did the thing right. I have a minus sign here, so this should be uh, g minus 1 here. That minus sign, I forgot about it. So, I put the order characteristic in. That's the order characteristic if I had a minus sign here. So I get 4 pi times g minus 1. But that's what I have up here, right? So 4 pi times g minus 1. So g minus 1 must be the degree of the Gauss map. So that's just algebra, OK? So that's pretty neat. So the Gauss map is a meromorphic function on these triply periodic surfaces of a certain degree that only depends on the genus. Okay, so the first thing you might think, well, when the genus is small, that tells me something. That tells me some things I already know. It tells me, for example, flat, if I have a two torus that's minimal and a three torus, it's flat. The degree will have to be zero. Now, what happens for genus two? Okay, let's try to apply that formula. Could I have a genus 2 minimal surface in a flat 3 torus? So M genus 2 inside a flat 3 torus. Could I have this possibility? Well, if I did, then the Gauss map would map me to the 2 sphere, and it would have degree G minus 1, right? But G is 2, 2 minus 1 is 1. Well, that means this is one-to-one. -one. This is a diffeomorphism. But if it's a diffeomorphism, this is not a surface of genus two. Okay, so let's just think about it. The degree of this meromorphic function is degree one. Well, that means it's a diffeomorphism, no branch points or anything. This is just a diffeomorphism of this surface with this, but the sphere does not have genus two. So we get a contradiction. So that's one of the... So the first things when I, I, this is actually stuff I did, looked at my thesis, this was just a first observation. I'm looking at triply periodic minimal surfaces. Can I have a genus two example? The answer is no. And that's somehow for these conformal properties of the Gauss map. So let's, let's look at what we can kind of say somewhat in general. And what can we say uh, in particular for genus three? Uh, genus 3 is interesting because you can construct lots of examples. For example, every flat 3 torus has a sequence of embedded genus 3 minimal surfaces in it, 
and the area of this, the nth surface is at least n. So you can have genus 3 minimal surfaces embedded in flat 3 tori, or fi any fixed flat 3 torus, and the area go to infinity. So you have lots of them. You have an infinite number of them in every flat 3 torus. So anything I can say about them is, you know, pretty interesting. It's telling me properties of something that really exists a lot of the time. There are lots of these examples. Okay. So we just observed uh, how to see that the genus is not two. Now I want to proceed on that sort of idea of this Gauss map mapping to the two sphere that gives us a contradiction for genus two. We saw we have examples of genus three. And uh, we want to see what are the properties of these triply periodic minimal surfaces? What are the properties of them inside of uh, the three torus? So one property is that uh, the surface always separates the three torus. Okay? And this is essentially, I, I think I'm going to go through a rigorous proof, but this is essentially true because a minimal surface in R3, if you look at a minimal surface in R3 connected, it always separates R3 into two pieces. Okay? Always separates R3 into two pieces. And if it's not flat, it's always connected. So that's a theorem we're going to do next time. So uh, if you look at this minimal surface lifted up to R3, it separates R3 into two pieces. And the pre-image is connected. That's we're going to see why that's true next time. It's called the half space, strong half space theorem. Two properly immersed minimal surfaces in R3 that aren't planes, parallel planes, always intersect. But when we take, take the pre image in R3, we always get a uh, connected uh, minimal surface. So, so the translations must leave it invariant. And since we said we had an orientable surface downstairs, the translations are orientation preserving, which means they leave invariant each of the solid regions in R3. So a little, a little thought shows you that the solid regions descend to solid regions in the three torus. Now that's not true for a two torus, right? Not true for a two torus. You might want to think why, but uh, it's true it's because if you take a two torus, a flat two torus, in a three torus, when you look at the pre-image of that, it's not connected. Right? You get a whole bunch of parallel planes. So it's just, that's the reason why it's not true. Whereas you take a higher genus minimal surface and you look at the pre-image in R3, it's always connected. So those translations always preserve the components. <clears throat> okay. Anyway, okay, so that's one of the neat properties. So I'm going to assume that we already know that. And we're going to try to analyze some properties. So as I said before, I'll try to get this not working so good today. Uh, I'm going to focus on this genus 3 case. But in general, I'm going to sort of explain a, a very general property uh, that comes up. It comes up, for example, this, 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 pr this part of this proof comes up in the part of the proof of the Abel-Jacobi uh, embedding theorem in Riemann surface theory, which says if you take an orientable surface, G Riemann surface of genus G, you can take a basis of its holomorphic forms, you can integrate those, and that will map you into the surface into CG modulo a lattice, which is a complex, tor complex torus. And the part of the argument I, I'm going to explain here shows you that that mapping factors through what's called the Albanese variety. So, so part of the thing I'm explaining to you here actually comes from something well known in algebraic geometry, that the G mapping of a Riemann surface into its Jacobi variety always passes through another complex torus called the Albanese variety. OK, so that's. So anyway, so I'm going to, that's how related to the constancy of certain, uh, certain uh, zero, uh, anyway, certain, certain sum of, sums of points. Okay, um, all right. So, right, so we already uh, saw that first thing, genuses uh, 
can, is the degree of the Gauss map is g minus one, and g is not equal to two. We already saw that. So this is this this very key step in the part of the proof of the Abel-Jacobi embedding theorem. Um, okay. So uh, we have our surface. It's uh, in a three torus. Okay. We have uh, its Gauss map to the two-sphere, and I want to define a map which is sort of called summation, which is S of V. Okay, so here's the round sphere, and I take a vector on it, and I look at all the points on the surface that have that vector as its normal vector. So I look at G inverse of that vector. So I, in general, I'm going to have g minus 1 points. So p1, p2, p3, p, g minus 1. I'm going to get g minus 1 points when I look at the pre-image of a given normal vector. Look at all the points that have that normal vector, OK? That's called the summation map, <coughs> OK? And it's clear certain things are true. If I change the normal vector, a little bit, then these points move around a little bit. And so this mapping here, this, this S map, this S, S map is continuous. Now when I say I take the summation, if I have a branch point, I need to count the multiplicity of that branch point. And then it's continuous. I count. So this is a continuous map. Now if I have a continuous map of the two sphere into a three torus, then I can, since it's simply connected, then I can lift to the universal cover, which is R3. Okay. Okay, so, but what is this locally? So the picture is, here's the two sphere, and take a little disk on it here, and what do I see above it? It's supposed to be away from the branch points. I see some a finite G minus one disks D1, D2, D3, and I have these mappings somehow that goes back. I have a parameterization of this disk by these individual disks above it. I have G minus one of them. So I have somehow functions, F1, F2, up to Fg minus one of them. I have these sort of lifted functions, and this map is nothing more, into R3, is nothing more than somehow summing, sum, or into here, I mean, you have to think about it. These are locally defined in R3, and I'm just adding up these, these minimal surfaces defined on this disk. So these are conformal maps. The coordinate functions in particular are harmonic functions. So the coordinate functions, because minimal surfaces, one of the properties of a minimal surface, its coordinate functions are harmonic. So this map, map into R3, its coordinate functions are a sum of harmonic functions, a finite sum, and therefore a harmonic function. The coordinate functions are harmonic functions. But by the maximum principle, that mapping, the coordinate functions must all be constant. Okay, so in other words, you then project that constant back in the three torus, we see that the image of this mapping, the summation map, the whole sphere maps to one point, and that should have been the two-sphere. I don't know why it's making theta. That's supposed to be a, some particular, a particular point on the three torus. So it's making a theta. It's my, I didn't realize that before. Okay, so it gives you a point on the three torus. Okay, so this says, uh, if I have genus three, let's go back to statement number three. If I have genus three, then after translating M in the three torus, which we want to think of as an abelian group. Uh, we translate so a zero of Gaussian curvature is identity element in the three torus, it's the origin in the three torus. We can certainly do that. Then this, then S of S2 is itself just that point, right? If you trans, a zero is, okay, so the picture for genus two is this. Above each point, we have two points. So here's the two sphere, 
here's my surface of genus 3. Above each point, I have two points on the surface with the same normal vector. And where I have a branch point, those points coalesce. So if I translate the surface so that a zero of Gaussian curvature is at the origin, then the whole map of the sphere takes the entire sphere to, to the origin because it's constant. Okay, so the, the branch, our branch point goes to the origin, everything goes to the origin. Zero plus zero is zero, right? We kind of add with multiplicity. Okay, so, okay, so, <clears throat> okay, so we have this, this statement here. And then, what does that mean? Well, above each, for each, so this, so above a generic point here, I take a vector here, I see two points above it. So if I take a point now, I have another point P prime with the same normal vector. The sum of those points is zero in the three torus. That means they're additive inverses. And the way you write additive inverses in an abelian group is minus. So those points have to be minus each other. Okay? And so in other words, this point is just minus this point. That means the surface is invariant under this involution, which is x goes to minus x. An element goes to its additive inverse. And that finishes the proof. Okay. So uh, notice, where do the branch points go? Where do the branch points go for the Gauss map? The three torus is an abelian group after doing this translation. So a branch point is two. It counts as twice. I have a uh, order two vector, a vector of multiplicity two at each branch point. And so they all go to the origin. So two times P is zero. So the branch points for the Gauss map go precisely to the elements in the three torus considered as an abelian group of order two. Those elements such when you add them to themselves, they go to uh, get, give you zero. Those are just the points in the three four torus that are halfway to the lattice elements of the quotient, you know, lattice that you mod out by, together with the element of order zero, which is the identity element. So you know exactly where they're placed because there are always eight branch points. This is a riemann hurwitz formula. There are always eight branch points and there are always eight elements in the torus which have order, t order two. So in fact, you also know where all the branch points are. So you have this very neat, neat picture. Let me just say something. It's also interesting what happens in genus four. So if you do the same proof for genus four, it tells you another interesting thing. So genus four minimal surfaces, and there are lots of them, uh, they, they have an interesting property. After a fixed translation, you get usually three points three points with the same normal vector, but g minus one, four minus one is three. After a fixed translation, what, what you get is if I know two of those points, then the other point is now minus, minus the sum of those two. In particular, if you fix the, the identity element, think of the surface in R3, and you look at a planes, all the planes that go through the origin in R3, they have on them uh, the points with the same normal vectors. Very, very kind of interesting. There's also something very interesting for genus three after, after genus four. And after genus four, it gets less interesting. But, but certainly, genus two, genus three, and genus four are kind of nice. Okay, so now we're going to try to come back and uh, try to, to understand, understand uh, minimal annuli where the boundary uh, curves are two convex curves and parallel planes. Okay, so we have two convex, it's like this picture, two convex curves, parallel planes, P1, P2. I have a minimal annulus having them as their boundary. So there's our picture. Uh, the first statement, number one, says if I take a plane in between these two, hor say, horizontal planes, might well be horizontal. Yeah, they said horizontal there. Uh, then I want to prove that this intersection is a simple closed curve and it's convex. Okay, that's what we want to do. Okay, so 
That's one property. And in order to do that, it's very useful. Well, it's not, you know, this is not essential, but uh, it's useful to notice that the Gauss map is a diffeomorphism. In other words, not only are these convex curves, but when I look at the Gauss map from the annulus to the two sphere, so we're going to be looking at the Gauss map, okay, then the image of that is an annulus on the two sphere. So the Gauss map param okay, this parameterizes an annulus on the two sphere. And we're also going to see that all these curves here go to curves that somehow go around, or go around the go around this way. They don't go this way and then come back. The image of these curves are somehow tied to the geometry of the boundaries. Okay, so we're going to see that as well. And then we have a very nice result. So we have the surface parameterized via the inverse of the Gauss map by a domain on the two-sphere. The, remember the Gaussian curvature was the determinant of the derivative map. Okay? And after playing around with some, some uh, properties of that, one sees that the oper this operator, we're going to talk about it more another day, uh, it's called the Jacobi operator. This, this operator here Remember, the Gaussian coverage corresponds to the term of the Gaussian. This transforms to an operator here, right? I have a parameterization. So I can try to look at properties like, for example, elements in the kernel of this operator, Jacobi functions. I can look at the eigenvalues of this with zero, eigenfunctions with zero boundary values. Anyway, this operator transforms into this operator on the two sphere, okay? And eigenfunctions of this go to eigenfunctions of this, and vice versa. Well, this is a very classical uh, op Schrodinger operator on, on the two-sphere, OK? Looking for, anyway, for, exa for example, the kernel or eigen minus two eigenvalues for the Laplacian. So anyway, we have uh, this operator there. And this operator is known to have only index 0 and 1. Therefore, this operator only has index 0 and 1. So this is a class, very old result, uh, oh my, very old, by Schwartz, back in the 1800s. It's an old, old result. So he kind of identified stability properties of minimal surfaces that were parameterized by domains in the sphere, by their Gauss map. OK, so, so that I'm not, I'm not going to need to prove. I just need to know item 2, and then I'll have this. I'm going to use that another day. So another day to do what? To prove this last property. So the last property says if you have this picture, then how many minimal surfaces are there that are annuli? Well, one possibility is if the Jordan curves just translate them away from each other really far, there's no minimal surface that's connected that bounds them. But if I get them very close and they somehow overlap in their projection, then I will have a minimal surface that's connected that bounds them. And once I have a connected minimal surface that bounds them, there's always a minimal annulus that also bounds them. So let me explain why, if I have any minimal surface at all, just to give you an idea, why is there always a, oh, there's a bunch of different, lots of different ways to do this, but let me just give you at least one idea. So if I have, for example, some minimal surface here. Maybe it has higher genus, maybe it's just immersed, but I have a connected minimal surface bounding these two. Then it turns out I can try to find uh, a minimal annulus in this region of space. So this somehow becomes what's called a barrier. And in, outside of it, I can try to find minimal annuli. Uh, of least area to have this boundary and this boundary, and I minimize over the annuli that lie outside of it. Okay, there are other simple proofs, more elementary proofs, but then I had to talk about other things. So, for example, the proof, the proof of this theorem, we don't need really to use that. So, 
you'll see that you just, anyway. But once I have something that blocks me from having this annulus come in, uh, then in fact there's always a least area embedded minimal annulus outside of there. So once I have some minimal surface that's connected, I have to have at least one minimal annulus. All right. Okay, so let's go through this. So let's try to see why is the Gauss map a diffeomorphism with its image, right? It's not, of course, onto the two sphere. It's a diffeomorphism with its image. And to do that, it's pretty easy. Okay, so maybe I should do it over there. Okay, is any questions? No questions? Okay. What? But that's a, that's, there's a bunch of reasons. Uh, one reason, I'll, if you, for, for you, I'll tell you one reason. <laughs> I mean, there's, there are lots of reasons. I, I could do solve plateaus problem in this manifold. This, that has two planes, part of two planes, has this minimal surface to our barrier. These two curves are homotopically non-trivial in that three manifold. I minimize with respect to annuli. They, okay, this annulus is injective on its fundamental group, but because there's a curve that links these two circles. There's a curve on the blocking minimal surface that, so these curves are homotopic and non-trivial in this manifold with boundary. Okay, on, an, another way to, okay, if you want a more elementary proof, take two big circles. We take two big circles outside of here, they bound a catenoid. Now just move those circles by convex curves over to these circles. Just do that, and uh, by some compactness theorem for embedded minimal surfaces, you can see that these curves also have to bound a minimal annulus. So there, there are other ways to do it, but the simplest way is to, is to use that surface as a barrier realize that the curves, uh, there is a mapping of an annulus that's homotopic and non-trivial, you can minimize in its homotopy class in a certain region of space. That's the, by the geometric Dane's lemma for planar domains. There's a, there's, a, you know, there's a result there. So, okay, so we're trying to prove that the Gauss map is a diffeomorphism with its image. So the first thing is just try to think of what is the Gauss map of the surface on, um, on its boundary. So I'm going to orient it so it's, uh, well, it kind of looks like it would be up here. So it's kind of pointed inward a little bit, okay? So that point on the two sphere is somewhere behind here, okay? And notice it's related, its projection on the plane here gives me an angle, okay? And that angle, those angles, so if I have uh, this normal vector here, I get somehow a vector in the plane. I can think of a, like a unit vector. That's the related, uh, the angle. Okay, so that point lies on what's called a, a longitude, right? Longitude, yeah, longitude. Okay, so that point there somehow makes the same angle in, as the, this vector in the plane. And as I go around, because the curve is convex, the vectors on, and say strictly convex, the vector tangent, the normal vectors to the circle, this curve here, they go around, they intersect each longitude on the sphere one time. So you have the longitudes on the sphere, and you can see that this curve here is a curve on the two sphere that winds around the north and south pole one time. The same thing is true for the bottom curve, okay? That doesn't mean that these curves don't intersect each other, okay? But then you use that this is an open mapping. Meromorphic functions are open mappings. So it's an open mapping property for, for, for these functions. And uh, you can see relatively easily that this curve cannot intersect that curve. So you just use the open, if they did, you'd get a picture that would look like this. Uh, I'm sorry. 
you get some curves that would look like this, and then you have a problem right here. You have a problem here. It's not going to be an not going to cover an open set around this point. So, a little a little thought shows that that the curves cannot intersect each other, and uh, and again, and again uh, anyway, and and so the Gauss mapping and open mapping is a degree argument. So that annulus goes to an annulus, and a little thought shows that it's an injective map. Okay, it, it goes around one time. It's a covering space of that annulus, and then, anyway, take a look at it. Okay, so, so the Gauss map is a diffeomorphism. That means we now have this result right here. So all these minimal annuli have a nice somehow Morse theory interpretation. They, they, don't, they come from very simple sort of variational problems. Okay. Okay. All right. So we now... All right, so that's that. So let me explain now, why are the level sets convex? Okay, so let's see. Maybe I'll redraw the picture over here. Go slowly, because this is a nice result. This is a nice result to give in a class. If you ever teach a class on minimal surfaces. So we have, uh, we draw it, convex, convex. And here's our annulus, plane one, plane two. Our plane in between, we have a curve, okay? <clears throat> and we have the Gauss map, right? So what I want to see, okay, by more theory, it's not too hard to see that I can't, every plane is transverse to the surface. So I'm not going to go over that, it's kind of elementary. Can't have critical points. But essentially by the maximum principle, you have to, Okay, so, so let's suppose that every plane is transverse and it gives us an immersed curve here, okay? And um, so I want to parameterize this instead of by its Gauss map, I'm going to parameterize it by a cylinder, by a flat cylinder. So let me tell you how to do that. So this is a flat cylinder, flat cylinder. That means I have a circle of some radius it's a circle of some, or some circumference, maybe it's better to think of some circumference. Right, it's a round, just a circle, okay. Cross, um, cross an interval. So let's put zero and one. So this is height zero, uh, height zero down here. So P1 is uh, X3 inverse of zero, and P2 X inverse of one. Say a plane at height zero and one, just to make it standard, okay. So times zero, one. So here's my cylinder, it's just sitting here. And I claim I can parameterize it by a flat cylinder and para parameterize it conformally. So I'm gonna parameterize this conformally by a flat cylinder. And so that the level set circles at a given height in the cylinder parameterize the related curve here at the, at the related height. Okay, so how do I make this flat cylinder? How do I create this parameterization? So one thing's difficult, the annulus is not simply connected. So first I'm gonna sort of deal with that. I'm gonna take a curve on the annulus, which starts, take your favorite point here, okay? I have the gradient of X3. I have that as a vector field. I have a vector field here. And I'm going to take an integral curve of the grade at that vector field. And notice it's always going up, and it gives me a curve that goes from the bottom convex curve to the top convex curve. So this is an integral curve of the gradient. Just, okay? Notice it's, it's uh, perpendicular to all of the level sets. Level sets, remember, are perpendicular to the gradient. Okay, so I'm gonna now remove that. So I'm gonna take my annulus, okay? Okay, so let's call A the annulus over here, or maybe I should, I guess I did M. A blue M in the, over there, so I have M. I'm removing this curve, say alpha. Remove the curve alpha here. Well, that's simply connected. I cut the annulus along that curve, I've made something simply connected. So in particular, on it, I have defined the third coordinate function, plus I also have, since it's simply connected, 
I can also define the conjugate harmonic function. So this is well defined on here, and I'm going to call that function f. So I take the, the harmonic function here plus i times the conjugate function. And if you don't know how to do to describe the conjugate function, you can ask me you know, after class. After, after this class, I'll be around for at least a couple hours. And if you have any questions uh, and you want to know something elementary and easy about uh, minimal surface theory, I'll be available. So um, I'll be at the, in the lunchroom for about two. Or if, I can be longer if you, if you want to talk a long time. So we have this, this whole homomorphic function from this disk into the complex plane. I'm going to draw the complex plane a certain way. I'm going to think of this as being the real axis, not usually how we do it. And this is being the imaginary axis. So it's the right orientation, right? It's just rotated from the way we usually do it. Okay. So when I do it this way, this is, uh, this is mapping into the real part, right? So the x ray we can think of as like height in this picture. And this is horizontal. So what happens? <clears throat> well, I claim that this domain gives me a rectangle, okay, it goes from height zero to height one in the complex plane, and goes from zero to some number lambda here, and I claim this is what I get for the image. I get a square, or a rectangle. I get a rectangle, and it has a certain length here. A little thought shows that if I glue back in alpha, that corresponds to making a cylinder where I glue these two sides together. So if I do glue those two sides together, that makes the flat cylinder that I'm talking about. So now I've parameterized, I've parameterized the annulus by this particular flat cylinder via these very specific holomorphic functions. So I'm going to go from here now to here and to here. So that's, that's what's happening. <clears throat> okay. Now, we already saw, okay, so now I want to look at the Gauss map. So I have the Gauss map here, and I have what's called the argument of G. So we can think of this as being the complex plane union infinity, right? I can think of the Gauss, the sphere as being complex numbers. So again, it'd be nice to have a picture. Okay, so hmm, let me put it here, okay. So the stereographic projection of the plane is North Pole, say, is at infinity. Here's the South Pole. And I have the, the remember, the longitudes here are just rays in this picture. Okay, so here's the stereographic, here's the complex plane here. Then kind of minus the origin. Okay, so there, there's a stereographic image. And we already saw that if you look at the top boundary curves, by understanding the Gauss map, relating the Gauss map of the surface with the Gauss map of the convex curve in the plane, we already understand that on the top and the bottom curves, I get curves that go around here. So they intersect each angle at one, one time. So here's, here's the image of that annulus in this picture, okay? Now, the angle is nothing more than the argument of the law. It's just the imaginary part of the log function. So the argument is not, in general, well-defined, right? When you talk about angles in the complex plane, theta is only defined up to multiples of 2 pi. So I have angle in quotes. It's not well-defined, it's, but it's well-defined up to 2 pi, multiples of 2 pi. So I have the argument function. But the argument is the imaginary part of a, essentially a holomorphic function. So it's a harmonic function. So we're going to use it. It's a harmonic function. Okay. Well, it's not, not well defined yet, but it's going to be well defined in a second. I'm going to take a derivative of it. So I'm going to take partial with respect to, I guess, think of this as the real axis and this is the imaginary axis of like x and y, then partial with respect to x3 of the argument of g. 
Okay, so I'm going to look at the partials back to x3 of this harmonic function. Now that is well defined because it's well defined up to constants. You take the derivative in the coordinate system, the, the, the indeterminacy goes away. So this, is, this makes sense. And notice what happens on the curves. Say the curves go counterclockwise in this picture. That means the angle is increasing. That means this function is bigger than zero. Okay, so I'm pos that function's positive on the top circle of the cylinder. Similar reason, it's positive on the bottom circle. If it were a harmonic function, it would be positive on the entire cylinder by the maximum principle. So positive on the boundary, and it's going to be positive in the interior. There, and we can identify what, what does this mean? These are just the... Uh, Remember, these curves now go to those curves there, and if those curves go around the sphere, then that means you're convex. It means their Gauss map also is related to the, the geometry of the, con of, the, of the curve in the plane. So it suffices to know that this is a harmonic function because then on every one of these curves, the angle would be increasing the normal vector of the curve in the plane would be increasing. That means it's convex. The question about degree doesn't go around like several times. It's an integer degree, so modulo that, that. So why is that a harmonic function? Well, what is the Laplacian here? What is the Laplacian in, in, in the flat plane? Well, when these coordinates, it's partial vector x3 squared, right? We're just flat. We're just in flat. It's like the real, real coordinate plus partial squared with respect to x3 conjugate. So I'm calling the, you have the x, these coordinates and you have those coordinates. They're just the usual coordinates in the plane, and that's the usual Laplacian. Well, this partial derivative is commute. So when you take the Laplacian of this, this pulls out in front, and you then get the partial derivative of the Laplacian of this. Well, the Laplacian of this is, is zero, because this is a harmonic function. Essentially, I mean, up to not being well defined, it's a harmonic function. So, because uh, we have this very nice coordinate system, it's very easy to see that this ang somehow the angle function behaves like its derivative behaves like a harmonic function, which is related to the curvature. The cur so the curvature is positive. Okay, so that's the uh, not complete proof. But I think that if you go home and you think about this proof, you say, "Yeah, oh yeah, I get it. I, I really get it." So. So uh, I think I gave you enough tools to hopefully figure it out uh, or feel satisfied. And I'm definitely not having much luck here. So maybe I will use this. Um, I'm not having much luck with my mouse today. Okay. I'll set. Okay. It's, how do I go forward? Are you, oh, you have to plug something in. Hopefully I'll, I'm not used to using this. Okay, so what do I do? Huh? Is it ready? Doesn't seem to be working. Not working. Should it's okay? Huh? Is now it's working? No. Okay, well let me just for the time being just go to the next slide by hand. Okay, so so the next few slides is just again so this is a very introductory course. See what lots of examples. Examples are important in the subject. We're just going to see a, a lot of examples, and they'll bring us up to new questions. Questions we'd like to solve, unsolved problems. Okay, so I think he said it's going to be working. Okay, so we have, for example, this minimal surface. Uh, this is an interesting part of the surface. What I mean by interesting, outside of this surface, this is a properly embedded minimal surface in R3. Outside, it's not very interesting. It very quickly, the middle part of the surface becomes asymptotic to the xy plane. This part of the surface becomes asymptotic to a catenoid in, and the top one also is asymptotic to an end of a catenoid. So away from this picture, I couldn't tell it's not pieces of planes and catenoids. It that's what it looks like. Here's where it's interesting, and that's 
where we want to try to understand what it looks like. So this surface is also interesting. It has a couple of straight lines on it. It has lots of symmetry, and somehow it's very special. It's, it's kind of uniquely defined. Uh, so Costa, of course, did his thesis here, and he wrote down uh, this surface in terms of meromorphic functions. And we're going to talk about uh, later today about the Weierstrass re representation. So there are ways to make minimal surfaces. There's a cookbook. So if you have mer certain mer meromorphic function, like the Gauss map, and a little bit more data, meromorphic data, on a Riemann surface, I can try to make minimal surfaces. So we're going to see how to do that analytically. So anyway, that's a good example. Uh, it motivated um, uh, David Hoffman and me to find a whole sequence of related examples. So here's an example maybe with genus like uh, one, two, three, about 16, I guess, or 20 or something anyway. So again, it's, it's very standard. It looks kind of like a catenoid and a plane that intersects it uh, orthogonally along the waist of the catenoid. And then that not embedded surface. So this, this gives you an idea that the surface looks like taking a catenoid. I take a plane. OK, so a plane, a catenoid. Of course, they intersect along a circle. OK, but somehow I can de-singularize this not embedded, not connected minimal surface by adding lots of little handles. And so that's what you see along the intersection of a catenoid and a horizontal plane that intersects in its waist. This is what I see. I see that surface. So when a genus is large, Costa doesn't look like that. But when a genus is large, that's what you end up proving happens on a certain sequence of minimal surfaces. And these are uh, finite, again, finite topology minimal surfaces. Finite genus, three n's. Okay, and I guess I was supposed to do that. Okay. So those are examples which have more than two n's. So there's a catenoid which had two n's, and these examples which I was just showing you had three n's, and there are lots of examples of finite topology minimal surfaces, okay? With four, five, six, seven, you name it, finite number of n's. There are lots of examples. Well, with one end, it's kind of tricky. We know two interesting examples of properly embedded minimal surfaces with one end. Well, a plane has one end, simply connected. We have the plane. The plane has one end. It's a minimal surface. We have the helicoid. It's a union of lines, and so it's not hard to see. Topologically, it's also a plane. Helicoid is topologically a plane. But if you try to add handles to a plane, how are you ever going to do that and make a minimal surface? Well, uh, David Hoffman, uh, Herman Karsha, and Way, they, they found uh, an interesting method for producing uh, a, a potential example of a genus one helicoid. So imagine, it looks like a helicoid, but I've attached a handle. Let's see, how do you, how do you turn on the... the um, you do the laser part? Right there. Okay, got it. But you have a handle right around here. So you take any helicoid, you attach a handle, okay? And how do, how did you how did they find this example? Well, remember we've been talking about parking garage structures a little bit. So these look like multi-graphs uh, that somehow maybe converge to a foliation of R3. They're like minimal surfaces together with a limit. It's a like a sequence, and they converge to a foliation of R3. Outs and er convergence is nice outside of, say, two vertical lines, so a horizontal foliation. And along the straight lines, it, they look like helicoids. I don't know if you remember, the Riemann examples had this sort of property. They, under a family, they converge to a picture that looks like that. And it turns out there are also, you can make, uh, so for the Riemann examples, I got two columns, and the helicoid spun in opposite directions. Well, you can make a parking garage structure that has three columns. So there are three, of, in the limit, you get sort of three vertical lines, and it looks like helicoids. Well, that's 
a limit structure, but you can back away from that limit structure by the implicit function theorem and see I get minimal surfaces. And then you can deform these minimal surfaces and uh, there's a proof in the annals where they do a, the deformation of these minimal surfaces and they actually prove that's what you get. You know, this, but it was clear that's what you get. I mean, you do the computer graphics pictures and you see that's what you get. There was no, there was no doubt about it. It was a question of, well, can we actually prove it mathematically? That you can, de you can desingularize a parking garage structure. I get a minimal surfaces which are periodic. And I keep twisting the per this parking garage structure. I sort of untwist it. And then when I, can, when I twist it somehow completely, I get this uh, minimal surface, which is a helicoid with one handle. The other spinning somehow, somehow doesn't, you don't see it after a while, somehow, the this, this spinning structure. OK, so parking garage structures, again, very useful for creating minimal surfaces. And I, I, I sort of convinced myself one could do this and, in fact, get any, any genus, but I never, never wrote it up. OK, so there was this question um, of uh, helicoid with uh, two handles. Could you make one with two handles? Well, it gets more complicated. You could again try the same approach. You could desingularize parking garage structures. In fact, you know, I guess Matthias Weber actually did that. He, he showed that you could take uh, a, a parking garage structure with, say, five columns, and you could desingularize, and you could make a genus two example, genus three, genus four, genus five, and so forth. He gets up to genus 11, it gets complicated. He kind of lost track of, of arguments. His arguments have now disappear. I mean, it gets harder and harder, more and more like techno. You can see that you need some kind of theory, anyway, to, to do the general case. But anyway, is there this genus uh, two example? And yeah, in fact, there are genus, any positive genus at all. There's the helicoid, and you have at least one example for every positive genus. Okay, so you can keep on adding handles. And you might want to think, what is the thing it looked like? Well, all these examples that you make end up having a vertical straight line on them, just like, just like uh, the helicoid. And they also have a horizontal line and a line of symmetry, which is the, you, if, you know, if you rotate around two lines that intersect, it's, it's the same at, by 180 degrees, you get another rotation. So there's a line of horizontal line of symmetry that's orthogonal to the surface that goes through all the handles. Those are the, that's the geometry that you have. So you have somehow the helicoid, you have this horizontal line, orthogonal to the axis of the helicoid, and along that line you place handles at certain positions. Okay, that's what we believe, is, there's no proof. The proof of Hoffman, Trisay, and White, very abstract, doesn't tell you anything about what they look like, really. But that's what we see when we make the examples. We see very specific, minimal surfaces. Kind of the same way that, uh, that uh, Hoffman, Way, and Karsha did. You take a parking garage structure, you desingularize it, you write that down, you just go to the limit of that, unraveling it, and you make the picture. You make the computer graphics picture, and you're happy. Yeah. These examples exist, but the proof is always hard, right? It's a, a rigorous proof. They prove it, they exist, but they don't really know much about them. Okay, so anyway, it brings us up to one of the, ba the main questions. So this is a question that came out of a paper, well, it appeared, at least it appears explicitly stated uh, in, a, in a paper I did with uh, Harold Rosenberg, where we proved the uniqueness of the helicoid. So we proved that if you have a non-flat, simply connected, properly embedded minimal surface, so a plane, properly embedded in R3, minimal, and it's not flat, then it's a helicoid. That's the only thing that you have. OK. And uh, it's clear from all these experiments that people do, or at least pretty clear to me, that when you make these genus G helicoids, there's only one possibility to do it. Now, that's experimental evidence. It's not a proof of anything. But based on that, we suppose that there would exist these examples, which people certainly could do if you pick a low genus and uh, with one n. There are th these examples, but there seems to be only one way to do it. When you try other ways, they always intersect each other or they, 
they don't, there's a problem solving periods, there's problems defining the surfaces rigorously or, or correctly. So it seems that there is exactly one non slat example for every possible genus. We know that for genus zero, okay? But even for genus one, it's not known. Okay. Okay, that next one. Okay, so now, let's see, how much time do I have? Uh, it's so uh, great, got lots of time. So now I'm gonna talk about something which is really kind of cool. I'm gonna go a little bit away from minimal surfaces and I'm gonna look at related things which are geodesics. So we're, we are all more familiar with geodesics on surfaces than we are with surf, minimal surfaces in three manifolds. Geodesics on surfaces is kind of easier to understand. So I'm gonna do some very class, redo some very classical results about geodesics, embedded geodesics on surfaces. And we'll see that those arguments have nothing to do with geodesics. We can apply those same ideas to minimal surfaces in a three manifold, or maybe even hypersurfaces that are minimal or constant mean curvature in N manifolds. So, but if you understand, in other words, if you understand geodesics, which much easier to draw pictures, I claim you really know, you have all the tools to understand the general problem. So that's, that's where we're heading. So it's not surprising I'm gonna start with actually a lamination of the plane. So we saw this before. Okay, so this is not a minimal lamination or anything. So I have these spiraling curves spiraling into a blue circle. So that's a decomposition of the plane uh, into a closed set. And that closed set are the union of the red, the yellow, and the blue curves, right? And it's certainly a closed set of the plane. And that closed set is foliated by curves, right? It, it itself, that closed set is foliated by curves. It's a union, disjoint union of curves. Furthermore, there's somehow a certain regularity property locally around any point on this lamination, the surface looks like parallel, it looks locally parallel. So, so if you, you can put coordinate, coordinate system. So if I'm on a red curve, red, then all I see in a little coordinate neighborhood is an arc. But if I take the blue curve, here's a blue, and I take a point on it, and I look at a little neighborhood of it, I can sort of pick a neighborhood so I see a sequence of arcs, blue, a sequence of red and green arcs. So let me try to redraw this. So here's blue. And I take a point on it. And what do I see? In some small neighborhood, a coordinate neighborhood around this is my blue curve, I see a, it's a limit of a whole bunch of arcs that converge down to it. Blue, red, I said blue, uh, red, green, red, green, red, green, and I have this sort of local nice picture. So everything is graphical and local, and certain local coordinates, and what I call normal coordinates, geodesic coordinates over, the, over that curve. I can pick nice coordinates, so I have this local sort of nice structure. Okay, so that's, that's, the, that's why this over here is a lamination, okay? Now, uh, you can go to foliations. Foliations means the lamination is the entire space. The closed set, which is the lamination, is the entire set. And what does CMC foliation mean? It means each, each of the surfaces, in this case it's in R3, each of the surfaces have constant mean curvature. So here is a question. Does there exist a constant mean curvature foliation of the plane R2? Well, yeah, you could take, uh, you, can, you could do that, right? You can foliate it by parallel lines, straight lines. Straight lines are geodesics. So in fact, there's a minimal foliation of the plane by parallel lines. Can you foliate the plane by constant geodesic curves and not have any singularities. In other words, suppose, can you have some curve that's not a straight line? 
Straight lines certainly work. We can foliate the plane by, right? But can you, can you foliate it by curves if constant g has a curvature? Well, if I have a curve of non-zero constant mean curvature, it's a, it's a round circle of a certain radius. Right? It's geodesic curvature is one over the radius. And then you're going to find a singularity inside that disk bounding that. So if you have a CMC foliation of the plane, in other words, a, fo a foliation by curves of constant geodesic curvature, and there are no singularities, the only way you can do that is by geodesics, straight lines, parallel lines. Okay, so, okay, so here's an example of a CMC foliation of R3 where you have some singularities. So these are like round spheres converging down to two particular points. You can have the radius go to infinity in finite time. Well, that just gives you planes, and you have a family of planes. And again, you can have, they, their limits of spheres of big radius that converge down to this point. So one can, in fact, prove that that's, that's what happens in R3. If you had a finite number of singularities of a CMC foliation of R3, or even a countable number of singularities, every leaf of, the, of that foliation has to have constant second fundamental form. It has to be round spheres. You have to have very special things, kind of like in the plane. In a plane, constant geodesic curvature just means a round circle. In R3, maybe there's some flexibility. So this kind of result saying, again, if you go from the plane to R3, things are very rigid as long as you don't have too many singularities like a finite number or a countable number. Uh, I keep forgetting. I'm so used to using that. OK, so, okay, so we're going to start this. Uh, I think we'll get pretty far with this. You, you'll, you'll start getting some intuition about, about this subject. Okay, So this is a, a Ramanian surface of genus uh, 2. And you can imagine a, uh, a, you could take kind of like a, uh, like a homotopy class, we take a sequence of points, see the red curve, you could take two points on it, and you could imagine picking a piece of string and wrapping it like I just did, and minimizing its length in its homotopy class relative to the two endpoints. And you could do that. And as I go along the red curve, if I was lucky, that red curve was itself a length minimizing geodesic in somehow the homotopy class of that that arc, and if I kept going forever and ever, it could have infinite length. So this, is, this red curve is supposed to represent a geodesic in this Ramanian surface that's embedded, okay, and which uh, limits to two other geodesics, right? Any kind of limit, uh, well, we're gonna see that in the proof, but any kind of limit of geodesics Geodesic have bound a second fundamental form. Locally, they look like little graphs, right? <laughs> Over themselves, so it's a kind of trivial in the geodesic coordinates. So, so um, we're going to see this kind of thing. So, uh, the, the, the results saying that uh, you have any Ramanian surface, you take a complete embedded geodesic on it. The closure of that geodesic, that's a closed set in the in the surface, it is a geodesic lamination. So it's a closed set. And that closed set is a union of, possibly infinite union, of, of uh, embedded geodesics. And locally, they have the same structure we saw here. Wherever they accumulate, they is a sort of locally parallel structure. So that's called, so that's pretty neat. So in particular, geodesics of infinite length. So we're going to see some more properties about geodesics in a little bit. Another interesting property Another interesting theorem is that if you look at these geodesics, you look at all geodesic laminations on a surface, then they are compact. Yes? Right, gamma itself might be, uh, in this picture it's one geodesic, its closure contains two more. But maybe the closure of the geodesic might be a foliation. Uh, so if people are familiar with a flat torus, take the standard picture of a flat torus. If you take a geodesic of irrational angle, its closure is a foliation of the whole torus. Right. Gamma does not need to be connected. Right, right. 
right? But it, the way we're doing the proof, it's connected. So the other key thing that comes out of this, it's the same kind of proof, is if you take a sequence, fix your Ramanian surface, take a sequence of uh, laminations. So for example, take a, in homotopy classes on, on a surface, if, if the homotopy class is representable by embedded curve, then it turns out the geodesic of least link in the homotopy class is itself embedded. If the homotopy class is, and one geodesic, closed geodesic, is of course a lamination, very simple kind. Okay, so if you take homotopy classes which are complicated, but rep are representable by embedded curves, then we have geodesics that are ver getting longer and longer and longer. So those geodesics we can think of as a sequence of geodesic laminations, very simple ones. But we have a compactness result that says every sequence of geodesic laminations has a convergent subsequence. So they're compact. It's actually, you can even make a sort of a metric space structure on the space of, uh, of geodesic lamination. So that's also going to kind of be important. Compactness results for laminations, okay. Okay, so uh, here's, the, here's the step one in that proof. So we're, we have our long geodesic, uh, I guess that's uh, gamma, the red geodesic, and we have this one that looks a little purple. Okay, that's supposed to, so, we, so in other words, we have a sequence of points on gamma that go to infinity on gamma, okay. So we, okay, so we have an embedded geodesic there, and we take a point in the limit set. So we take a divergent sequence of points in the geodesic, but yet they accumulate at some point. They, for example, limit to some point P. Then through that point, we want to see there's a geodesic. Maybe there's several geodesics that go through that that are somehow in the limit set. So we want to try to understand that. So, okay, so we look at coordinate, <coughs> coordinates around this point, and uh, because geodesics have bounded second fundamental form, they have zero second fundamental form, they just look like horizontal, just like coordinates. Uh, coordinates in the in the space. So uh, anyway, uh, so um, so what we see is a, a bunch of graphs. We see this sort of picture, a bunch of graphs that they are making sort of small angle because they're geodesics in the coordinate system around P, and these graphs converge to a graph. Or even better, look at the tangent vectors at those points for the geodesic gamma. Well, that sequence of tangent vectors certainly converges to a tangent vector. A unit, say a unit tangent vector, right? In a tangent bundle. And through that vector, there passes the geodesic. So you can think of that as the geodesic. So uh, remember, a geodesic is determined by its velocity vector at one point. Okay? So that's, we get, so we get a geodesic, and not hard to see that geodesic that has that direction is in the limit set of those other graphs. Okay, so that's, that's step one. The limit set is a union of geodesics, okay? Now, now we need a little bit of structure. We want to show that different geodesics don't intersect. We've got geodesics and they cross, that's not a lamination. So we want to see that when we get these defined geodesics, they don't cross each other. Okay, so geodesics are embedded and pairwise disjoint. Remember, that's the property of a lamination. The, the, the curves, in this case, are called leaves of the lamination, and they're all embedded and we have this locally parallel structure. So anyway, so the, uh, they're embedded in pairwise disjoint, and this is, uh, right. Suppose if you, if, if, so this is all pretty easy. Okay, so suppose that you had two limits and they crossed. So we could take compact arcs, geodesics are determined by the velocity vector. These geodesics intersect transversely because they're determined by their velocity vector. So this could be the same geodesic, but think of them as being a, a certain limit and another limit. Well, the limits are pretty nice. This was a limit of uh, gamma, right? So nearby it, I see these geodesics on gamma converging to it, and they converge C1. Similarly, over here, these they have a sequence of geodesics that converge to this arc. Remember the original gamma, where these segments lie on, is embedded. But it's clear by transversality that gamma would intersect itself when it got very close to 
this intersection point for the limits because we have this sort of nice graphical property. Okay, so this is a limit of graphs. This is a limit of graphs. The graphs lie on an embedded surface that's globally embedded and that would contradict embeddedness of the approximating geodesic. Approximating geodesic is limiting it. It would have to intersect itself, but it's supposed to be embedded. Okay, so they intersect on transfers. This is just the rest of the argument. Okay, so, uh, so anyway, we got the geodesics and the limit are embedded and they're pairwise disjoint. They can't intersect each other. Okay? All right. Okay, this X gamma. Right. Uh, right, of course, this, anyway, there's nothing going on there. GFS are determined by their velocity vector at one point. So, anyway. So, uh, anyway, so that proves this property. It's kind of a local property where we think of geodesics as being graphs. Those graphs converge, but there's some kind of uniformity in how that happens. So we decompose the surface into geodesics. It may be the case, like it happens on the three, two torus, it may be a foliation. So let me just draw that picture again. For the flat torus, we take, right, we take a uh, flat torus. Uh, it's supposed to be a square torus. Okay, so zero, one, one. You glue these two sides together and you glue those two sides together. And if I take a, a geodesic of where well, the angle is irrational, so that's a straight line here would be a geodesic. The closure of that geodesic is a foliation. So you can have, or you could have canter set. Maybe the closure of an embedded geodesic is a canter set. If you remember the picture we did before, it was very simple. In this case, uh, I just had two, two curves in the limit set. But I could have a canter set. It could be very complicated, the limit set. Okay, and again, uh, like I said before, we had this nice compactness result. It's really the same proof. If you understand the previous proof, this proof is the same thing. So the, um, it's again sort of a local global argument. You get local limits because everything is locally sort of looks like parallel lines. Geodesics in a small coordinate system just look like straight lines. And uh, so you get sort of local convergence and then uh, you do some diagonal argument, you do a covering argument and you, you see that uh, everything works out. So it's pretty straightforward. So I'll do, I won't go over that argument. It's, it's, it's really just the same kind of thinking. Why, you, you know, how do you get the limits? You, you get them the same, same kind of way. Except now you have the geodesics are moving. Uh, but you, you get convergence around some point by taking a subsequence. It's, it's, it's convergence in a sense, every sequence of laminations has a convergent subsequence. So of course, in general, things don't converge. But after choosing a subsequence, I have nice convergence on compact regions of the surface. All right, so I can always exhaust the surface by compact domains if it were non-compact. Or you can just think, I'm just doing this on a compact surface and then I have a finite number of little coordinate charts. Everything goes well on those coordinate charts. So anyway, that's, that's standard. So how do, we, how do we generalize this to the things we want to do, which is try to understand minimal and constant mean curvature surfaces inside of a three manifold. So what are the analogous results? What is this cl geodesic closure theorem for minimal surfaces? What's the related result, okay? So we wanna analyze that. We have a minimal surface complete and embedded in a three manifold. Is it true that its closure is a minimal lamination? That would be one of the questions. So replace geodesic by minimal. Okay, sometimes true, sometimes not. That's the claim, but you know, that's, who knows? I mean, we did, we're still trying to understand these things. So, um, so let's, let's see. So uh, H hypersurface, where this is an n-dimensional thing, just means co-dimension one, submanifold with constant mean curvature. Think of all these things in R3, in three dimensions. I'm not ever gonna go out of three dimensions on these things, so. Um, uh, what is a weak H lamination? It's 
uh, unfortunately, okay, so an H lamination means you, you have your manifold N, okay, and you have this closed subset which is foliated by surfaces of constant mean curvature exactly H. So in this case, H is a number, it's a fixed number. Those are called an H lamination. You could talk about a CMC lamination. That just means you again have these surfaces, which are the leaves of the lamination, and they have, each individual one has constant mean curvature. But an H lamination means I fix a particular number like one or zero, and I look uh, for a lamination which all the leaves, all, all the leaves in this lamination have that same mean curvature, okay? Now there's a hypothesis here, okay. All right, so let's see. Um, in a hypothesis here, I hope I said it, yeah. I want, as a hypothesis in this theorem, in the second bullet here, that the surfaces have what is called locally bounded second fundamental form. Geodesics, I didn't have to worry about this. They have zero second fundamental form, right? Geodesics have zero second fundamental form. So, so in, but what this corresponds to in local coordinates, in local geodesic coordinates, locally bounded second fundamental form implies that everything, where you, where you have an accumulation point, everything looks graphical. It's like this picture. You have this locally bounded second fundamental form means that in some kind of nice coordinate systems, wherever I have a limit point on the lamination, everything is graphical around that point. The surface doesn't curve too much relative to the exponentiation of its tangent space. It looks like a graph. Each individual leaf looks kind of like a graph over its tangent space, and that's a, a uniform, uniformality about that. Okay, now, when it, why, why do you say weak? Weak, weak allows you, allows the leaves of the lamination actually to intersect. So now we, we have the closed set, but maybe we're being a little bit looser. We're allowing the leaves to intersect for an H lamination. And uh, a good example of that would be um, two spheres of the same radius. Okay, so. This is radius is one, this radius is one, then this would be an example of a weak one lamination of R3. So in other words, we actually do allow the leaves to, to intersect to the point. If the leaves are minimal, then this property by, but, okay, so there's a local property. The leaves could intersect somehow on one side, they can, somehow one leaf can be locally on one side of another leaf, like this, okay? So I still want this somehow, they're, they're graphical in the neighborhood of the point, but maybe those graphs, one touches another one from above, like in this picture. Uh, by the maximum principle, when you have this picture, on the mean convex side, it maybe think of a family of spheres with the same constant mean curvature, I can't draw an R3, but uh, then on the mean convex side of a leaf of an H lamination, you actually have their actual lamination. The, the leaves don't intersect each other. So it's, it's all a little bit strange, but it takes a little getting used to it. So you can have this picture. You can have the mean curvature vector pointed in this direction. That allows these leaves to intersect, but any leaf very close to here on this side of that leaf, I will see an actual lamination. So this leaf together with the leaves on one side of it, locally, that is a lamination. They don't, these don't intersect each other, and vice versa. Th these on this side don't intersect each other, but this one could intersect that one. So that's if you had the same constant mean curvature um, value, okay? All right, so anyway, that's unfortunately a little complicated definition. Okay, so. We have uh, foliation of an end mantle is called a CMC foliation. If all of its leaves are uh, <clears throat> H uh, hypersurfaces, H varying, right? 
And here we had the, the good exa one interesting example on the plane. So this is a CMC foliation of the plane by circles and, and straight lines, right? A straight line here, but I have a singularity at the origin, right? I could imagine classifying all the possible examples, right? It wouldn't be very hard. You go to, the, go to R3, it's a little more complicated to classify them, but uh, again, you can understand them pretty well. Uh, essentially, there are always uh, two real singularities, whatever that means. Um, one are, are two real singularities. So concentric spheres are centered at the origin would be a good example with one singularity. And here's a picture with two singularities. And no singularities means the only possibility is, two is a family of parallel planes. So minimal, you have a family of parallel planes, one singularity, or you have two singularities. OK. And uh, if we have time, I'll go into and explain how do you some aspect of this. So a very important aspect of proving this result is to obtain what are called curvature estimates for CMC foliations. So if you have a, a Ramanian ball, three ball, and it has a CMC foliation on it, at the center of the ball, there's a curvature estimate. That curvature estimate does not depend on the foliation. It's a number. So curvature estimate means when I look at the, the surfaces, they all look like uniform graphs if I'm sufficiently close to the origin and the gradients are, 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 are not too big. So I get this sort of nice sort of bounded geometry picture. So that means that the, well, that's good. CMC foliations are good because they have this curvature estimate. And then we can apply all those theorems that we did for geodesics. So a sequence of CMC foliations of a three manifold are compact. Every sequence of CMC foliations has a convergent subsequence. So just like what happened in geodesics, because we have this curvature estimate. So when you want to do compactness, these compactness arguments are real important when you want to do something. So for example, uh, try to do this classification theorem. Another very important part of the theory, which unfortunately most people shy away from, if you want to get very far in the subject, in my opinion, you have to try to understand what happens when things happen bad, or if they can happen in a bad way. In other words, singularities. Can we have singularities? If we do, do they have a structure to them? What, is, what are the properties of having a singularity? Can you have a minimal surface in a three manifold with an isolated singularity? Famous problem. We don't know. So we're, I'll be talking about maybe that problem a little later. But um, anyway, so let's just go to, um, go to, uh, to talk a little bit about this. So here's a general conjecture. Very important, you're in R3. You're not in hyperbolic space. This conjecture is not true in hyperbolic space. So we've got to be careful. We're in R3 with its usual flat metric. Then the claim is if you have a minimal lamination of the complement of it, that set, and the set is kind of small. Suppose one point, finite number of points, countable number of points, some close set, or maybe it somehow has low dimension. It's like a canner set of, of dimension zero on an interval. It's somehow a small set, then the claim is the lam minimal lamination always extends across this small set to a lamination of all of our three. Okay. All right. So that's important. And uh, right. So uh, there's a very important. There's some case. This is I put our names here because we we prove something that turns out to be extremely useful. I f at least I find it extremely useful. Almost everything I do that's interesting and deep uses this next uh, result. So this says uh, when you have <coughs> so. Uh, so, and it, I guess you could also conjecture that, you could do a more general conjecture for what are called H laminations. But anyway, let's focus on minimal there. This theorem, though, is for H laminations, okay? Or even weak H laminations. So remember, in a weak H lamination, the leaves have locally bounded second fundamental form, and if they intersect 
then they intersect on one side of each, of each other. They kind of don't intersect in a bad way. And on the mean convex side of each leaf, I have a lamination structure. So they're kind of like lamination, almost like laminations. There's a little bit of possible intersections. And I also have locally bounded second fundamental form. It's a property of the definition. OK, so I have a weak H lamination of uh, three manifold outside a closed countable set. OK? And suppose for every point, think of the set as being one point, for example. If for every isolated point in that closed countable set, I have a curvature estimate in some small neighborhood of it. In other words, the norm of the second fundamental form uh, is bounded by some constant that depends on the point and divided by the distance to the point. So it says that, yeah, the, the norm of the second fundamental form could get big, but it kind of gets big like one over the distance to the point. It could get big, but it doesn't get big at too big a rate. Okay? Then this lamination extends across that set. So if, uh, I can say, natural thing, think of finite number of points, one point, but it actually works, uh, the arguments actually work for a closed countable set. Okay? So that's the first thing. In particular, this estimate implies the norm of the second fundamental form is actually bounded in the, neighbor, in the neighborhood of S. If S is a singular point, a possible singular point, a point in the closure, uh, if, okay, this, anyway, you have a lamination in here. In fact, we have bounded second fundamental form in a neighborhood of each of these points because a lamination has bounded second fundamental form. So we have, so if you have some estimate, then in fact you get a much better estimate. You actually get bounded. Everything's graphical. Okay, so, so if you have a lamination, well, in general, we have lots of laminations. We can create lots of minimal laminations in the complement of small sets of points. For example, in hyperbolic space, we can create laminations outside of a point. There are minimal laminations, lots of minimal laminations outside of a single point. Now, those laminations, in general, do not extend across the point. This estimate doesn't hold. But these laminations can have limit leaves. So inside every lamination, you can look at the set of limit leaves. Those limit leaves where you accumulate. Okay, so the leaves where it's your locally, you have a sequence of disks converging down to a disk. So like a limit geodesic, like those green geodesics on that surface we looked at earlier. So the limit set is, is always a sublamination of the lamination. Okay, so, so the limit set, okay. So you have the, somehow the, I didn't make I didn't define this rigorously, but you have the limit leaves of the original lamination, and the claim is, on those they are stable, whatever that means, and stable implies curvature estimates that have this estimate. So even though the, these laminations that we see a lot of the time do not extend across a potential singularity, their limit leaves always satisfy this estimate. And so their limit leaves always extend. Again, very useful. Because lots of times that's all you need. You need to see that the lamination is organized nearby the potential singular point, organized in the sense that there's some kind of a plane that goes through it. So the leaves approach from one side or from the other side of the singularity. The plane going through it means uh, the extension of the limit leaf through the the singularity. The singularity of the lamination, but it's not a singularity for the sublamination of limit leaves. Okay, all right, so that's really useful. Uh, boy, this is interesting. Uh, this is a long, long theorem. Uh, maybe I'll come back and talk to about it another time. Okay, so um, yeah, that would take a while. Okay, so. Um, it's a very general, very useful theorem. So I'll come back and talk about it another day. But I just want to, again, just I have about 10 minutes. I can talk a little bit more about what are singular minimal laminations of R3? At least singular means there are laminations outside of some closed set. 
And suppose this closed set is not very big, like closed and countable. Okay? And you can say, well, are there such things? You know, it gets, remember, we have a conjecture. There aren't such things. They, the laminations always extend across to a global lamination. So what I'm going to show you is, is not the, what we believe actually happens. So, but if, if, if we did have a lamination that's minimal in R3, this is what it would be like, okay? It would be kind of reasonable a lot of the times, okay? And if you, so we'd have uh, singularities like this, for example. So we'd see a ball around a point, and through that ball, we would see a properly embedded minimal surface with infinite genus. So a famous conjecture says, that's not possible. You can't, you know, in the unit ball in R3, if you have a properly embedded minimal surface with the origin in its limit set, so it's properly embedded outside of the origin, it always extends across the origin. Very subtle question. Uh, when I gave a talk at, this at the conference uh, a couple of weeks ago here, uh, there was, a, there's a, there was uh, one of the students, he's trying to prove that you can make such singularities. You can produce, pr prove that there is a properly embedded minimal surface in the unit ball outside of the origin. You know, uh, you know hats off to him. I, you know, every time I go back, I think, oh, maybe it's not true then you start understanding why it's probably true. I don't think he's going to have any success. There are good methods for trying to do it. They just don't work in, because it's not true. So the claim is we don't have this kind of singularity. So infinite genus, Gaussian curvature going to infinity outside of a point. OK, so that's one kind of picture. And another nice thing is it turns out that these things are all actually minimal verifolds. They all have finite area. When you're properly embedded outside of a point, they have finite area, and you have limit tangent cones. They're called limit tangent cones. They have a somehow a, somehow a uh, kind of like a linear structure on how they approach the singularity. A not necessarily well-defined linear structure. So and again, comes, OK, so yeah, okay, it's a whole other question. The uniqueness of limit tangent cones. Fundamental basic question, the subject, which is not known. That's one thing that could happen. We have this somehow finite area problems at an isolated point. Okay, suppose you can get rid of those. We won't have those. Then we have, uh, we have these other points where the area accumulates. So in the neighborhood of this point, the lamination does not have finite area. Okay, that's a, another possibility. You, this picture, I have finite area in this ball. But maybe the, there's a limit leaf somewhere. Well, remember, limit leaves are stable. They satisfy the estimate, so limit leaves extend across the closed countable set. So wherever I have limit leaves, I produce stable minimal surfaces. Stable minimal surfaces are planes in R3. So where the area accumulates, I see planes. So I see a plane. Maybe I see another plane up there. I see a closed set of parallel planes. And outside of these planes, I see a properly embedded minimal surfaces outside of sort of like points, closed countable set. And you might, uh, one thing that helps to understand uh, all of this subject is, is a theorem of, I uh, forgot the guy's name, I always use it. Uh, if you're, what's that theorem? Uh, if you have a countable, com countable, complete metric, bear, bear, it's like Bear's theorem. It's not Bear's. It's uh, what's the name of that theorem. Closed countable metric space. Then the countable. What's the name of that guy? I was, I'm forgetting the, the thing. Anyway, if you have a, if M is a is a countable, complete metric space. Base. Yeah, locally compact. Maybe you have to have locally compact. But anyway, countable. Oh, let's say count, all right, countable complete metric space, for example. Uh, locally. Anyway, locally. Okay, so this could be the singular set that we're talking about. You have a, a minimal lamination of R3. 
outside of a closed countable set. Well, a closed countable set has this property. So one thing that helps a lot is Bayer's, Bayer's theorem, is somebody saying? The inside of here, if you look at the isolated points, the points which are just around them, that all you have is that particular point, they're always dense in this, uh, this space. Okay? And that allows you to really, when you do a problem with a closed countable set, only an analyze isolated points. So it's a nice proof technique. So when you do the, a lot of this stuff, you really only need to look at isolated points. You still can do the closed countable set. Okay, so anyway, so we got these planes, and then we got, you can, you, you want to prove that you have infinite genus in a neighborhood of the planes. There are lots of things you try to prove about these laminations. So you can prove some very deep, deep, hard theorems that tell you what about every minimal lamination of R3 in a complement of a closed bounded set. All right, so that's, that's one of the things we'd like to understand better, but we don't have yet, okay? Okay, so one of the first things is, uh, I didn't talk about item six. Item six is the case when you do a certain rescaling argument, you produce a singular lamination of R3 with a closed countable set of singularities, possibly. Uh, the other things are better. The other limits are nice. The other limits in this theorem are properly embedded minimal surfaces in R3 and parking garage structures. Unfortunately, we have possibly certain singular lamination limits when we do this uh, rescaling argument. And they have the property, they have a countable number of singularities. Well, yeah, I guess a countable number of singularities. So that's why we want to understand these minimal laminations with a countable singular, number of singularities. Anyway, the claim is that you don't have, and when you do this particular problem, you don't have these, uh, these, other, these weird uh, limits. You only get parking garage structures and properly embedded surfaces. Okay. So uh, I think that that's a doable theorem. I think that's a real provable theorem, but I presently don't know how to do it. Um, okay. Okay, so now I'm going to um, <coughs> go a little bit more back into the classical stuff, sort of easy things, and look at some examples. So I guess we'll do that next time. So uh, it's about time. So I'm going to go back and I'm going to go over uh, the first part of my talk. Next time will be lots of classical examples, how you make them analytically, how you create them. And it's something called the Weierstrass representation. So we're going to be thinking about how that's a tool for doing studying minimal surfaces, at least in R3. Okay, so that's that's it for I think for probably a good time to, to stop. Uh, all right, and like I said, I'll be around at least for a couple hours. Uh, could be around longer if you if you, anybody wants to ask ask questions about you know whatever. It could be something related to your research or whatever. So I'll be I'll be in the cafeteria at least for a while. <laughs>